I'm so grateful for Women's Midweek. There's nothing quite like it, nothing that can compare to it, and there's nothing that can compare to just being back together as women. So just give it up for yourselves for just being here tonight. And I'm excited for the lesson as well as Haley shared. Tomorrow's my birthday. And I'm getting to that age where I see, I'm getting to that age where I see friends posting about how old they are. And I'm like, we're that old, like us, all of us collectively together. I used to see older cousins and older aunties and uncles turn that age. And it seems so far away. And yet here we are. And it's amazing to still be alive. It's amazing to be in the kingdom of God, to be worshiping God, to be walking in purpose. It's been an indescribable gift. And it reminds me of 2 Corinthians 9, and specifically 2 Corinthians 9, verse 14 and 15, where the Bible says, and specifically Paul is writing, and in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And I just love the fact that regardless if it's our birthday or not our birthday, God does give us indescribable gifts. The gift of life, right? The gift of wisdom, of his holy word that we get to read each and every day in order to stay steadfast and faithful to him. The different people that he places in our lives to teach us, to counsel us, to guide us. And this, around this time, I always start reflecting on some of the biggest lessons that God has taught me. I'm really big on reflecting and growth and all those types of things. And I always go on a date with God during my birthday and just get a chance to write the lessons of some of the, the incredible things that he taught me this year. But what always amazes me is how most of the lessons come from tough times or frustration. Like, I don't think there's one lesson I learned because everything was just like rainbows and butterflies. I don't know if you guys learn lessons that way. I don't know if I'm just like, it needs to be drilled in. And then I like understand, oh, love, you know. And so the title of the lesson today is The Gift of Pain. The Gift of Pain. And we're going to start off with one of the characters in the Bible who has suffered a lot. Yes, Jesus, but also Job. Let's turn to Job 36, verse 21. The gift of pain. Job 36, verse 21. The Bible reads, Beware of turning to evil, which you seem to prefer to affliction. <laughs> Welcome back to Midway, guys. But I love this scripture because God always keeps it so for real with us. I've been hanging on with the campus, and they say that a lot, so for real. And specifically here, what happens is when tough things happen and tough times happen, instead of those times bringing us closer to God, oftentimes they can bring us closer to sin. Yeah. And it says beware of that, meaning like it's going to happen. Prepare, stand guard, be alert so that this doesn't happen, so that you don't fall in this way. And... In the kingdom, it can be a little bit different because I think in the world we expect pain to happen. Like we expect people to hurt us. We expect things not to work out. We expect people not to be kind, you know. But in the kingdom, like our brother and sister in Christ, like that's not really an expectation that we have. And so we go from handling pain in the world by giving people the silent treatment, cutting people off, all types of things. And now we're in the kingdom and we're being hurt but we have to learn how to have spiritual pain management in a lot of ways, how to be spiritual and how to not turn to sin because we understand it's not just sin will send you to hell, but sin hurts God. And we don't want to hurt God anymore. And for me growing up, I hated pain, but what I hated more was my parents 
discipline and they're holding the lesson over me and reminding me that I messed up in this way. And so I remember one time hanging out with my cousins at home. We would do all sorts of things that my mom and my dad would tell us not to do. And one of them was rolling on the bed. I don't know if you guys, I couldn't do cartwheels. I still can't do cartwheels. If someone wants to teach me, I'm so more than happy to learn. But we would like literally roll in a ball like this flip over. I don't know if anybody did that growing up. And so we would flip over, over, and over, and over again. And my mom always told us not to do it. And one day, I do it, and my neck crimps to the side, and I cannot, for the life of me, move it. And so I'm just, like, walking around like this, and we're, like, looking, like, I don't know if we were, like, Googling things, but they're, like, putting, like, lemon and oranges on my neck, trying to, like, loosen it because I don't know how citrus is going to seep into my skin and help. I don't know. I don't know what we're thinking. It's definitely Haitian remedy. And so we're doing all of these things. They're rubbing oil, Louis Muscati, all of this stuff to, like, loosen my neck, and nothing is working. And I wasn't even scared until my mom's car came in through the driveway. And I'm like, she's home from work. And I'm broken. And I'm never going to hear the end of this. And so I go and I, like, for the best of my ability, go and hug her, pretend everything is normal. And everyone's just, like, watching, waiting to see what will happen. And then just this time to do this, by the time I get in the house, like, I'm in so much pain. And I run into my room trying to hide, and my mom's not dumb, you know? Like, she knows when something's off. It's like she has a radar at work, you know, like thousands of miles away. And so she's like, what's wrong with your neck? <laughs> Nothing. Yeah, I want to hold it like this. She's like, Regine, what's wrong with your neck? <laughs> And so long story short, we rushed to the ER, and it was so bad, they actually gave me a neck brace. Yeah, I was about to endure just so I didn't have to hear. That's how, you know, that's how bad it was. And to this day, I still get neck cramps from that injury. But the thing about pain is after a while, it does get better. You know, after a while, you're just like, wow, like, it's not that bad. In that moment, oh, my gosh, horrific. I didn't know how I was going to survive. That actually happening, and my mom, <laughs> you know what I mean? But over time, you learn to deal with it. And that's the thing, we're all going to go through pain. And it's going to hurt. Physical, relational, mental, relational, spiritual, relational. <laughs> Did I mention relational? It's going to hurt, and we're going to suffer until we get to heaven. And yet, why do we suffer? Because we're going to heaven. And God promises that there will be a time where he will wipe away every tear. There will be no more death, no mourning, no pain, and just worship and goodness in his presence. And so why does pain have to happen on earth? Why do you guys think God allows pain? You guys can raise your hand or shout it out. Why do you think God allows pain? Absolutely. And so we need pain in order to learn and grow in our character. Absolutely. Mm. It helps us to enjoy the sweetness of not being in pain a little bit more. Yes. Haley. It shows us who we really are. Yeah, it's kind of like you don't know what you're made of until you're in hot water, that kind of phrase, Ms. Brenda. Mm, it causes us to rely on God, because otherwise we'll just be out here doing whatever we want. Yes, Coach Mo. Absolutely. It wakes us up. And all of these answers are absolutely true and absolutely perfect. But what I want to put before you, ladies, is pain is the very thing that tests our faith. 
you won't know if you actually have faith until you're in a position where you start to question and doubt. That's when you really have to be certain of what you hope for and assured about what you don't see. When it's your wedding day and Disneyland and you just get a thousand dollar check in the mail, you won't know if you're certain about what you hope for and assured about what you don't see because right now it just seems good. But in those low of lows, you really get to see God and he gets to build your faith and reveal exactly what you're made of. And so point number one, no pain, no faith. No pain, no faith. And it's incredible because I mention relational quite a bit because I think sometimes it's easier to handle the physical, the mental, even sometimes the spiritual. But when it's someone that's close to you, that you love, that you've invested in, that means something, that you gave your heart to and they were the ones to like put some holes in it, like it, it goes a little bit deeper than, than normal. And yet oftentimes when we talk about friendships, the best friendships that we want are those who've been loyal. We use words like ride or dies. We say they've been with us through thick and thin, you know. They stood beside you and they had faith in you. That's why you appreciated having them in your life. They were confident enough in the low of lows to still stand by you. They had a certain level of faith, right? And oftentimes, we too need to show God that we have a level of faith, that we're willing to stand beside him, you know, like not just when things are going well and he's giving us the desires of our hearts, but even when things are going bad, that we're not just going to renounce him, that we're not just going to reject him and just go back into the world, that we're going to keep our faith no matter how bad it gets, right? In 1 Peter 2... I was really inspired by um, Jason's staff lesson. He preached um, spiritual pain management. If you haven't heard it, please go listen to it. It's amazing. It's funny enough, this lesson is a mix of Jason and Sarah, so I'm grateful for mentorship and just all the people in my life to teach me. Okay, I need to be taught all the time. So in 1 Peter 2, verse 20, 1 Peter 2, verse 20, it says, But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And I appreciate this because God doesn't play no games. You know, he's like, if you do something bad, and you suffer, that is called consequence. And consequences are good because it teaches you boundaries and it helps you to not do that again. You know, if you put your hand on a hot stove, you learn real quick. When it's hot and the button is on red, don't put your hand there. But it says when you suffer for doing something good, it says it's commendable before God. And just to think that, like, we can be noble and honored before God because of the way that we suffer especially when it's unjust. But it takes a lot of faith to suffer righteously, to believe that the heavenly reward is worth the earthly troubles. Yeah. And often we can be bitter, we can complain, we can be destroyed, or God offers us another opportunity where we can accept where we are, we can be trained by his discipline, and we can overcome it. And what inspires me is that when I suffer righteously, I understand a little bit more of how Jesus was willing to do it because of his love for me. Like, wow, like Jesus went through this. Like, for me, someone tells me something mean, and I'm like, I want to call down the legions of angels. What number do I dial, you know? And yet when someone says something mean to Jesus, he's like, it's okay. Jenny's worth it. It's okay. It's okay. Donna's worth it. I need my baby girl to know that she's worth every single bit of what I'm going through. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that incredible? In Hebrews 5 or 7, we don't have to turn there, but it talks about how Jesus lived his life on earth with fervent cries and tears 
petitioning out to God for the one who could save him from death. And he had a reverent submission as he suffered. And it's really awesome because God's son was called to suffer. And us as God's daughters, we're called to be priests. We're called to be ambassadors. In 1 Corinthians 6, it says we're going to judge the angels, which is, I don't even know if I can handle that much responsibility and authority. But in the pain, we get to suffer because it builds our character to be more like God, and we're refined through the process. Um, again, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, same book, new chapter, 1 Peter 4, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. And if we drop down to verse 12, it says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. And so as we're suffering, the scriptures call us to have the same attitude as Christ, But then it says, don't be surprised that pain is going to happen. Like, we need to be able to expect it, but we can rejoice because we understand that we're going through things that Jesus went through. And it's incredible because, again, like I mentioned, coming into the kingdom, it's not that there is no pain. You just get to do pain with God versus pain without God. And someone that I really want to lift up is actually Stephanie. And so Stephanie has been studying the Bible for a few months now, and it was incredible because our sister Monse reached out to her while she was doing, she was getting an ultrasound. And she was talking about how she's been praying, and they immediately connected. And her first time out to see the kingdom was actually Women's Midweek. She always calls it Women's Ministry, which I love because it's true. We're all women's ministry leaders. And so she's been coming out for a few months. She's been doing Bible studies, and she's transformed into a completely different woman. And she was amazing when I met her. You know, like, it's not like she was like, oh, my gosh, like, who is this person? Like, she was incredible. But to see the reverence that's grown, the love for God that's grown, and the transformation in her heart that started inward. But literally her family's like, you just have a glow about you. And she's like, yeah, it's the Lord. That's kind of what happens when you get these beauty treatments of scriptures, you know. But it was awesome because as we were doing the church study last night, Um, we were talking about just different areas that we can trust God. And she was talking and talking and talking, and I just looked at her, and I was like, wow, Stephanie, you don't even understand what you just shared. Just a few weeks ago, we were sitting at a different table over there, and you were talking about a series of things that led you to fear, and in that you took control, and you chose sin as an avenue to do it, Now you're in a difficult situation, but you're choosing to trust God. That's probably been the full 180 out of everything else. I know she's thrown things away. She's changed so much about her life. But just to see the surrender, like I am going to suffer, but I've decided to do it righteously because I trust God. And tonight, Stephanie will become our sister and is getting baptized. And so I just have one question for you ladies. Have you surrendered to the pain that you're going through to the point where now you're actually growing from it? Have you surrendered to the pain that you're going through that you've actually started to grow from it? Where you still have joy, where you're seeking God with your whole heart, And you're not waiting for circumstances to change, to accept the fact that God says you can be superlatively happy. Okay, I'll say that again. (laughs) I'm glad I have notes. Have you surrendered to the pain that you're going through to the point that you're actually growing from it now? where you still have joy, 
You're seeking God with your whole heart, and you're not waiting for circumstances to change to accept the calling that God has given you to be superlatively happy. (laughs) And so if you're visiting tonight and you're going through some pain, we all are. But I wanna encourage you to study the Bible to allow the woman who invited you out to help you to repent and learn how to navigate this pain with God. And if you are a baptized disciple and you are in pain, me too. You know, but I want to encourage us ladies to remember that we didn't sign up for a life of absent of pain. We signed up to do pain with God. And I want to call you to recommit your perspective that you're doing this with God. God is not doing this to you. He's doing this with you. Point number two, forgive or forego. And it's our favorite scripture in Matthew 18. Are you guys still with me? Okay. Matthew 18, verse 21. Point number two, forgive or forego. Forgive or forego. They don't let me song lead, so I'll be singing up here. Take that, Brianna. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Matthew 18, verse 21. It says, the parable of the unmerciful servant. (laughs) She said, yikes. (laughs) Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Sheesh. (laughs) There are many challenging scriptures in the Bible, but I would have to say this is top three. And what's incredible here is this man had 10 million pounds of debt. I don't even know how much that would calculate into American dollars. And he had a servant who owed him 100 pounds. Contrast 10 million from 100, right? And yet his attitude was that he deserved what he was owed, but he shouldn't have to pay back what he owed. 
and he owed way more to God. And Jesus teaches this parable because forgiveness is one of the most spiritual, difficult, relational things that we must do. And it could very well be the very thing that keeps us out of heaven. To the point where Jesus says in verse 35, unless you forgive from your heart, you won't be forgiven. And in Isaiah 59, we understand that sin separates us from God. Unforgiveness separates you from God. And in order to repent, we have to understand that our sin grieves God. Not rationalizing it, not justifying it, but understanding just how much it hurts him. But there's quite a few reasons why we don't want to repent and why we don't want to forgive. One, we like our sin. Like, it's comfortable being here. You know, I get to be mad at you. I get to, like, give you the silent treatment. I get to stare at you and roll my neck and not have to do what you asked me to do that I don't want to do. Like, that's awesome. Sounds like I'm the boss. Also sounds like I'm lord of my life again. Two, because sometimes we can be emotionally lazy. It's too many emotions. I'm not trying to deal with all of that. Journaling takes too much work. My hands cramp up. I'm okay just being okay. Like, I don't have to thrive. I just got to manage, you know. Three, we don't understand how serious it is. is. Like, do you know all the things that I've changed? Like, this is fine. I'm sure God will let me into heaven with this one. Like, it's not that bad compared to those. Four, maybe we're waiting for the person to change or apologize first. They got to earn it. Once they earn it and I find it sincere, then I can forgive. Or five, and I think sometimes we can fall into this one quite frequently. I know that I can too. Is we just feel like we can't. Like I've tried and we've lost hope and faith that this will work. And so when we get stuck again, we just kind of quit. And like I said, I've been all of these. And um, there was a specific time where I was hurt by a leader. And I just wanted to forget and move past it. And in the process, really, I was unwilling to address it and to forgive. And I remember there was a retreat that we were on. This is back in um, New York. And Tyler Scagliota now. She was sitting with me, it was funny enough, it was my birthday, and just in pain on my birthday, guys. Like, it's really the gift of pain, okay? And she looked at me and she's like, you're unwilling to give it to God. You're still holding on and your heart is stuck. I'm like, accurate. She goes, you're unwilling also to do the heart work that it's going to take for your heart to be right with God. I'm like, you're right, (laughs) and I can't really argue with that. But that's where I found myself as a Christian. After confessing my sin and seeing just where I stood before God, that I could still be so vengeful and so stubborn to hold anything against anybody else. I was unrepentant of bitterness. I was so unloving in my heart, had so many impure, critical thoughts towards this person. I was super vengeful, and there was deep hatred, all because I'd been hurt. And I knew it was hatred because it was numb. Like, I didn't care. Like, I didn't really think much of them. And that shows how cold and how hard your heart must have gotten in order to get to that place where you feel nothing. But it was because I cared so much. But when you put biblical terms to it, when God talks about hatred, he says it's like murder. And I'm just like, okay, that's too much. Like, okay, that's just too much. But unforgiveness in a lot of ways is deep idolatry. It's elevating your pain and you, yourself, above God and his pain. It's looking at the cross and saying what I went through was worse. It's looking at the cross and saying what I went through is worse. It's a deep-seated pride 
It's hearing what God has done for you and asks you to do in return, but scoffing at his request. It's debaucherous. It spreads without you having to do a lot of the work. The girls around you feel it. Your kids start to become a product of it. Your marriage is impacted by it. Your coworkers, just, you just find less and less wanting to hang out with you. It defiles other people. That's what the Bible tells us. And you're triggered by simple things and choose the comfort of loathing a child of God than taking those emotions to God and asking him for strength to help you overcome. It's entitlement to your pain. I was so entitled to my pain and a refusal to ex- acknowledge the death of Jesus or the depth of Jesus's pain. But in that, it's also hypocrisy. Because you won't acknowledge God's pain, but you want this person to acknowledge yours, to understand yours, and to sincerely apologize in a way that you view as genuine or else. It's selfish. And it's not because, like, it's selfish because you want to feel bad, but it's selfish because you refuse to let God help you feel good. Like, you push God's love away. You push away his mercy, his grace, his protection, and his comfort. And all God wants to do is hug you up and love on you. So you choose to separate yourself to him, from him, after he already spent your entire life winning you over. You're making him do more work and reject his love again and again to go back to self-preservation. And the Bible tells us there are two things that are essential for a Christian and essential before we die specifically. One is that we die forgiven by God, but the other is that we die having forgiven other sins against us. And he put such a huge emphasis on not just us being forgiven, but us forgiving others that we see just how much it hurts him. Sorry. And so who is it? Who do you have to forgive? Is it your mom? Your dad? Your brother? Your sister? Cousin? Aunt, uncle? Your husband? Your best friend? Your ex-best friend? Ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, is it your daughter, your son, is it your leader, maybe it's me, I have apologies, I'm ready to give, so are you going to forgive them, when? Because if we really believe the Bible, if we really believe the Bible, then we really do believe that tomorrow isn't promised. And if we really believe the Bible, then we really believe that sin separates us from God. And if we really believe the Bible, then we believe that we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And so when are we going to do it? Tonight. Right now. Do not go to bed without starting a journal entry or a letter of forgiveness towards this person. Do not go to bed with anger harbored in your heart. Sisters, I care for you. I care for you, for each and every one of you. And this will hurt your relationship with God beyond anything else. Repentance has to be radical and it has to be rapid. And you're saying that this is the cost of your salvation. An apology that you may never get, that could never take into account what you've been through anyways. That Jesus' death wasn't worth more than that. Like that's how much his death really meant. 
He saw every single bit of our sin and our offense towards him. And yet he cleansed you and wanted a relationship with you. He cleansed me and wanted a relationship with me. And if we can't forgive, what it results in is we stay in torment. There's so much harm by choosing not to forgive. Our relationship with God is affected by us choosing not to forgive others. We close ourselves off from his grace, from his love, because we keep telling ourselves we don't deserve it. When his grace and his love can help us through anything. And just to go back to the story, I made a decision after Tyler's conversation to repent that night. And so I spent a while journaling my most raw, honest feelings, seeing how much each of those things hurt God and his people. But I walked out of it with a heartfelt conviction about my sin. It's crazy because I started, like, they did this, that hurt me. And, like, you know, your paper gets a little bit, like, about to tear because you're so angry. And then you look back and you're just like, whoa, I'm, like, super wicked. I thought that. I did this. I didn't do this. Like, wow. And you still wanted to be with me? And you gave me enough time in your kindness to get me here? Like, it just blew my mind. Like, I literally walked out feeling more in love with God and more loved by God. And that's my prayer for all of us tonight, that we walk away from this feeling more loved by God, more seen by God. Because the way that we want people to hear us and see us, they could never. They could never. And yet God is in those depths with us. And I just want to close out in one scripture. It's in Psalm 139. And this is one of the scriptures that just reminds me that my love can't come from people as much as they try, and they're amazing, but it can only come from God. Psalm 139, verse 1. And we're just going to look at a few of these. Psalm 139, verse 1, the Bible reads, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I go make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, Even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light becomes night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. Okay, there's a little bit more coming out of his heart. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. 
See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And the church says, amen. Amen. Tell me who could know you like this. How many years they would have to spend insight into your mind that you don't give to anyone, access to your heart, things that you're not even aware of. This is how seen and loved and known and heard we are by God Almighty. If anyone can heal you, if anyone can help you, if anyone can love you, run to God. Expect that of God. Take the burden off of these people who cannot do that. That's why we're here in the first place. We expected them to. And we were disappointed when they didn't. I want to end with one story. Ron Lee Davis shares a powerful story of forgiveness about a priest from the Philippines. The clergyman had carried the weight of one particular sin that plagued his conscience for years. He was so guilty, even though he's working for God or working in the church, he was so guilty. Though he had repented multiple times, he couldn't shake the feeling that he was still, he would still be punished by God. At one point in his ministry, there's a deeply religious woman that loved God and claimed to have visions in which she spoke face to face with Jesus. (laughs) The priest was initially skeptical, and so he decided to test her by saying, the next time you speak with Christ, I want you to ask him what sin I committed when I was in seminary. And so the woman agreed. A few days later, the priest asked, well, did Christ visit you in your dreams? Yes, he did. She replied, and when you asked him what sin I committed, what did he, and she, he said, and did you ask him what sin I committed when I was in seminary? She responds, yes. He asked, well, what did he say? She replies, he said, I don't remember. What God forgives, he forgets. And let us be women who forgive and forget. And to God be the glory.